So thank you guys for the opportunity to come and talk to you about this project. Um, I'm the lead for the Mountain National Parks and I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about how we got to the point where we decided to use cabin, how we created our first cabin model, and then what, how we've been applying it in some ways that are a little bit different than how we had initially envisioned it. And um, this slide is also to remind me to tell you that it isn't just me and just one person. Um, the image is uh, on the left is my team. So inside the mountain parks, I have a team of people that help me do this work uh, in the fall. And then I am also speaking on behalf of all of the seven mountain national parks. It also includes uh, Waterton and Revelstoke and Glacier, in addition to the four that are connected, Jasper, Banff, Yohong, Kootenai. So it was a... Um, actually really satisfying to sit down and kind of reflect on all the things that happened that got Parks Canada to this point. Um, the story sort of starts back in 2005. Um, I think every land manager knows that they need to do some sort of monitoring um, for whatever their objective is and whatever their institution's work is. We also know it's really hard, it's really expensive, it's really boring. Um, but it is essential. And so in 2005, the United States National Park Service was working on their vital signs program, and the province of Alberta was working on the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, ABMI, and the Parks Canada CEO really wanted Parks Canada to also be um, part of this movement to really bring monitoring to the forefront. He wanted to sit at his desk in Ottawa, have a dashboard, be able to go to a map, dive into his parks and see how things were going and report to Canadians. And so there were some significant investments for Parks Canada to try to do this. At the same time as all of that was happening, um, Parks Canada already was doing water quality monitoring. We were using water quality index in the same way that Emily had described at sentinel sites on each of the large rivers in the mountain national parks. And we were applying the CCME guidelines um, into, into this indexing. And we were in this um, planning cycle where we were working on the 2006 State of the Park report, which feeds into our management planning. And we knew that the percent, like the water quality guidelines weren't really um, telling us very much in the parks because in some, for some of the parameters, we would be seriously polluting our waters if we were anywhere near them. They just don't make sense for us because the water is super pristine and ultra oligotrophic. So, um, Clim uh, Environment Canada was working on helping us develop a percentile approach to try to make it sensitive to our local conditions. Also around this time period and in the decades leading up to it, Parks Canada had made attempts to do biological monitoring. We'd done some widespread sampling that was done annually. Canadian Wildlife Service and Environment Canada had given us advice on how to set it up. And we were really struggling with it. We were struggling on the delivery of it and we were struggling on what the analysis meant. Um, so it was falling apart. Another kind of unrelated thing that was happening at the same time is um, leading up to this time period, Dr. Dave Schindler, who used to be at the University of Alberta before he retired, had been involved closely with Parks Canada on um, a big review of um, things that were happening inside the Mountain National Parks, and it led to something called the Banffville Valley Study. And through this, he realized that we were struggling with um, some of our reporting related to water. He was an expert, he's a limnologist, he knew we were also having some issues with our wastewater treatment plant. And so he got a graduate student, a PhD student, um, working in the mountain parks on this. And she started her research in 1998, and she finished in 2013. And she chose to use the US Multimetric Rapid Bioassessment Program. So it is another biomonitoring program. It's widely used in the United States. It's not based on reference condition. It's based on upstream downstream comparisons. And this was the method that she chose. And she was focusing on the five wastewater treatment plants that were in the mountains, the contiguous mountain national parks. And it turns out that um, when I came along in 2005 and started my job, three of those five wastewater treatment plants are in my region. So I had the most wastewater treatment plants to worry about. The multimetric approach is robust. Uh, there is no doubt about it. It's also expensive because you have to do these upstream downstream controls and you can't uh, generalize it to a large geographic area. You really are looking at a stressor point. 
It's also not DIY. It, it doesn't have a training program. There's no web, pl web platform or database or all of those other tools that Environment Canada is developing to support this. But we knew that Benthics were telling us some really strong things and that this was the way that we were going. And then also at this time, uh, ECCC um, was working really hard. Uh, the Pacific Yukon region where Yoho, Kootenai, Revelstoke and Glacier are located is one of the cabin um, focal areas in the country. There's a large concentration of technical staff. The cabin lead is there. And they had already worked on the Fraser model and they had made a decision that they were gonna be starting to apply this more broadly in British Columbia. And they, we already worked with them closely on the water quality monitoring inside Yoho Kootenai Revelstoke Glacier. And they came to us and said, we're gonna start applying cabin here. And do you wanna work with us? Uh, so the map on the right just shows you how the mountain parks all come together and where Yoho and Kootenai sit. And um, it doesn't show Revelstoke Glacier or Waterton, but we can't forget we're including those guys as well. So that was sort of the, the background about how we got here. Um, as Emily mentioned, um, there's a jar here. I don't have a nice figure like she does, but this is what happens after you kick. And there's some benthic invertebrates in there. They're diverse, they're abundant. I can see quite a few species in there. Some of these taxa are super sensitive. They're amazing at integrating cumulative effects. They're easy to catch. And then again, this strong support network was being developed with standard tools, training and certification. I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit of the timeline for uh, how we developed it and made this operational. Um, so in 2006, we decided among the seven mountain parks that we were going to do this as part of these new monitoring investments. And we were super fortunate uh, that Environment Canada had this tool that was ready to go. And the aquatics team across the mountain parks went to this new pot of money that the CEO had put forward to develop monitoring programs. And we just grabbed a huge chunk of it at the beginning because we had a plan and it was gonna be completely deliverable. So we got super lucky about getting over that initial investment hurdle. Uh, in 2007, we sat down and we did a joint GIS planning for our first try at site selection. And our goal um, was to create seven to 10 replicates of each stream order elevation combination across the seven mountain parks. And we only looked at montane and, and uh, subalpine because this is where we have most of our impacts and concerns, not in the alpine. And so this is what we did as our first cut. Uh, that first year, everybody also had to do the cabin field training certification. We wanted one person for sure in every park to be fully trained and people needed to go do their swift water certification uh, because of an internal health and safety standard. And we took on a regional SWAT team approach where the park biologists would be there and be responsible for the sites in their park, but a team of other staff from other parks might come and actually help. And we moved around as a group to get across all the parks because some of the parks are very tiny and are have very low staff resourcing, whereas as the larger mountain parks we've got um, with Banff and Jasper, we've got a bit more staff resourcing. Uh, most of the sites for our model were collected that year. Uh, in 2008, um, Environment Canada and BC Ministry of the Environment came back to me and said, we're trying to build this model in the Kootenai, Columbia, Okanagan. You are part of it. And we're having a hard time finding large river pristine sites that aren't um, impacted by logging or mining. Can you please help us? So we went and oversampled some locations in the mountain parks to contribute to this regional um, process that was happening outside of our boundaries. Uh, in 2009, we started with our model building um, and we were working jointly with Environment Canada in Vancouver and we were hoping that we were going to be able to have this large model that would include Kootenai Columbia and the Mountain National Parks because ecologically we're super similar. We ran into a large issue with uh, the GIS the national GIS doesn't play very nicely across the continental divide boundary. It's a little bit different between Alberta and BC, and it's essential that your GIS and mapping tools are totally consistent. So it became clear that we weren't going to be able to co-develop a model with Environment Canada and BC MOE that would include the Alberta site and the BC site. So we needed to develop our own model. So that's when I said poop, because that was going to be a whole lot of extra work. Um, so we cleaned up all of our data in 2010. We had to do some error checking and we hired a model builder to do this for us because we didn't have in-house expertise. 
in 2011, they built the model and it was loaded to cabin. It was built outside of cabin in a statistical program. And then we had to do a little bit of sensitivity testing. But at the same time, I was so confident that this was going to work that we started routinely collecting field samples, even though our analytical tool wasn't quite ready. In 2012, we had another little tiny setback. Our major analyst left and we had to train a new analyst. But after that person was trained, we finally had a totally operational tool running and we got to the backlog of results. In 2013, it was the last year of the multi-metric method. So for a couple of years, I was simultaneously paying a consultant to do one thing and we were doing something else. So we would have some comparability and then we were confident that Kevin was working and we could end the first thing we were doing. And then in 2015, we started our first field campaign for the State of the Park report, which is the whole reason the CEO wanted this in the first place. He wanted to, on every 10 years for us to report out on the State of the Parks, pick all our monitoring data, feed it through there, and scope out the management plan. Uh, in 2018, we wrote the State of the Park report, and now it's 2020, and the new management plans are just about done, and reference condition for the first time is a stated objective for some of the water quality things that are inside of the brand new management plans. So can I have the next slide? I want you guys to learn from what we did. It took us a long time and we went down a few little blind alleys, but there's um, so many people working on this now that it is not going to be like our experience. A uh, couple of years after we got started, there was International Polar Year. I don't know if anybody else remembers it, but Nahani National Park uh, learned from what we did, took money, did one year of field collection, and within two years had a running cabin model for Nahani National Park. Um, so it's, it's um, where we've gotten way better as we've gone along. You could complete a model uh, probably six to 12 months after all of your benthic data is ready. So um, our experience was totally sorted out some things. And now with this National GIS um, guidance, it's going to be much easier for anybody coming after. Um, if Alberta did decide to uh, explore this along the East Slopes, um, this map on the right is showing you random pristine sites that already have been collected for Jasper, Banff, and Watterson. And we would contribute those to the province for whatever they needed in the same way that we contribute sites from Yoho, Kootenai, Revelstoke, and Glacier into a BC uh, provincial model. We could help potentially with some sites around our boundaries, but another way we can help is I am a, a field certifier. Um, so there's potentially some assistance that we can provide with people to make sure that they're um, being consistent and that everything is working well um, with their sampling. And then there are several ENGOs and consulting companies around that do have certified cabin samplers, um, particularly because this is a recognized um, resource analytical method in the province of British Columbia. So next slide, please. Uh, here are a few basics from the Mountain National Park model. So this is a predictive model. It's not like a, it's not like a theoretical model. It's based on these field collections of these, um, this reference collection. Our model ended up using 104 sites, uh, cabin sites across the Seven Mountain National Parks. Um, when we started the model building, we looked at 54 candidate predictors, and we experimented with three different sizes of benthic and vertebrate community groupings. We looked at a four group model, a five group model, and a six group model. In the end, the best model for us is a four group model, and it has 11 predictors, and it explains about 80% of the variation about what's going on with the benthic community. So it's very good. Um, the key pieces in our model, they sort of break out into three bits. Um, the first stuff is land cover, and quite a bit of the land cover variables come from GIS. And they are basically an expression of kind of how much carbon is in the system. So it's all of these shrubs and things that are dropping their leaves in the fall, and it's energy, basically. Uh, how much water is in the system. So we've got the water component as well as this wetland herbaceous. So those are our key GIS-based sort of uh, land cover variables. Then we've got one climate variable. It's how much precip we get in June. And then we've got some of the field collected variables that explain the channel. And basically, they're kind of explaining how big is this, how stable is this water, um, and how steep is this water. So depth, velocity, maximum velocity, the bank flow width, and the pH. And so if we know these 11 things about a stream, we can predict 
what we expect our bug community to be based on the reference collection that we made. And then we can go to a site and we can sample it. We can look at those bugs and we can say, we expect them to look like this. Is the observed equal to expected? And if it is, that means we are within reference. And if it's not, then it means that we might be witnessing some sort of um, problem with our ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I thought I would show you a little bit about what a result looks like and talk to you just a little bit about what it means if you have a site that's not in reference or what are some of the reasons you might not because this is what the Mountain National Park staff all get very worried about if they have a site that's not in reference and it's failed and, and they want to know why. So the image in the top left um, is what one format of your data output can look like. So this is an ordination and people like these because they're super intuitive. In the middle is the gray ball and then the little green dots. So those little green dots are in multi-metric ordination space. Those are the reference collection for this group. This is where they sit. And then the blue dot that is out in the yellow band is this test site being compared to who, what group the model thinks it should belong to. And the further away it is from its little reference cloud in the middle, the more perturbed um, or divergent it is from its reference collection. And so you can see this site um, is out in the yellow, getting kind of close to the red. So there's definitely some issues with it. Um, and so that's what, one of the things people like, but you can also generate all of the standard metrics and, and different analytical um, methods that people typically use for benthics. So down at the bottom are three creeks. They're underwater photos. Um, and we've got this nice creek on the left. It looks pretty good. The rocks are really clean. We've got this intermediate creek on the right where we definitely have some algae issues and I can't see the rocks very well. And then we've got this creek on the right and things you can clearly see. I have several species of algae, which I should not have. Interestingly, all three of these sites are not within reference, including the one on the left. So this is nice. The bugs are telling us stuff that we can't necessarily see just by, you know, going out to the stream and having a look. Um, and the one on the right, I'll talk a little bit more about it. It's an impacted wastewater treatment site. So if you do get a site that's not in reference, you need to not panic. Um, and you just need to step back and take a moment. So it's always possible that we, that we have an 80% um, overall prediction success with the model. So statistically, one site out of 20 just from statistical error might come back as not being within reference. Um, so it could be related to model error. Another thing that we have very commonly seen is that people have entered, accidentally entered data entry errors into those 11 super important predictors. And if they have an error in there, it could send it to the wrong group. And then it's trying to compare the wrong ecosystem, uh, benthic communities. So that's um, checking your data is a key thing. Um, but then sometimes it's really true. And you can look at your bugs and um, typically they kind of fall into two categories. They're depauperate. So you don't have the same number and we're missing some key taxa that would be expected for that site. Um, so that could happen because of sampler error, but it also could happen because you've got compacted substrate, uh, which is actually what's going on in that picture on the left hand side on the bottom where the rocks look pristine, the water chemistry is perfect. We had a fire here. And I think that the chemistry of the water changed and it sort of cemented all the rocks together. And so when you go stand in there, they're really hard to kick. And all of that space uh, between those rocks where the bugs would normally live isn't accessible to them right now. Uh, we also get channels moving as well, or if you accidentally sample at the wrong time of the year and the velocity is too high. We also can see systems that are enriched. And so the guys on the right are enriched sites um, and it can happen for natural reasons because uh, you definitely get some inter-year variation or you might get flooding, uh, but it could definitely be human caused. And so typically when people get a site that has failed, um, the first thing I do is tell them to consider resampling. So let's uh, have the next slide, please. Um, because we've operationalized this, I thought I would just share with you a little bit about how the workflow goes. Um, so you have a, a window in the fall to collect your samples. Um, asked, and when you are collecting your samples, you're collecting some water and you're collecting your benthic macroinvertebrates. The water will go off to a lab. It's typically 70 to $150 to have uh, the water analyzed per site, depending on if you add any extra parameters or there's something you're worried about. And then your bugs are gonna go off to a certified uh, taxonomist 
And this year, our taxonomy rate is about $310 a jar. So that is the kind of the, the actual dollars that you have to pay. Um, after you have gone and done your field work, typically in November, December, January, you're entering your field data and your chemistry into the cabin website. And then your taxonomist is working away, uh, analyzing all your bugs. And when they're ready, they can go into the cabin database as well. And then they will directly enter your um, identification information. And then after that, you can run your test site analysis for your site and you can generate all of these different reports as well as the standard um, metrics that other people use. Um, so there is a little bit of a delay from when you collect your data in the fall till when it's available, but it's for us, we always end our taxonomy at the beginning of fiscal, so I'll be expecting my data in the next six weeks. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about uh, how we're using one model in four different ways. Uh, so I'm going to go over how we're using it for the condition monitoring program and the state of the park reporting, which is why we developed it in the first place. But I'm also going to talk about looking at our wastewater treatment plants, our rotenome project, and understanding fire impacts. Uh, so next slide, please. This is what the CEO wanted. He wanted to sit at his desk, drill down to Yoho National Park, which is what you're seeing on the left-hand side, see that there's a green ball, things are good for water quality and stable. That's what the, ar the arrow is all about. Um, so this um, is the results of the 2018 field campaign. Um, it's a little bit faint to see, but I think there's like uh, 16 um, little triangles in that map. Uh, 15 of them are green, they're good, one's yellow. Um, and we said if 80% of our sites were within reference, we would rate the overall rating of the park as good. And this is the um, ordination of our Sentinel site on the Kicking Horse River, which is the main river site. And that's me actually sitting there. Um, so these sites don't actually even need to be like totally pristine remote sites to be in very good condition. This is just downstream of the bridge to the entrance of Field BC. And this is the one of the headwater rivers of the Columbia. And then that's just the team doing the field sampling. So objective met, hopefully CEO is happy. <laughs> Can I have the next slide? So I talked to you about part of the reason we got into this or we were willing to accept the validity of this type of approach is we had this graduate student that had used a different method but had demonstrated that benthic invertebrates are a super robust way to check up on your wastewater treatment plants. And in the Mountain National Parks, we had five. Three of them are in the Lake Louise Yoho Kootenai Field Unit, which is my operational unit. All of our wastewater treatment plants were upgraded as a result of the work that this graduate student did. They were sort of all upgraded in the 2003 to 2006 time period. I have one at Emerald Lake Lodge and I have another one uh, just outside the town of Field. These two are packaged membrane bioreactor style plants and they're working wonderfully. So I am not going to talk about them anymore. They were not um, working wonderfully before, but we upgraded them and they are doing well through time. What I do wanna to talk to you guys about is Lake Louise. So Lake Louise is a old fashioned mechanical plant with um, the, the, um, the ponds that are aerated and all of that. And then in 2006, when we upgraded it, we added biological nutrient removal and an alum drip. And this wastewater treatment plant gets the most loading. And I'm gonna show you some data that shows that the loading that's been happening since our increase in visitation has probably overtaken the upgrades we did in 2006. So next slide. This um, slide, I just wanna orient you to it. I know it's busy, but I think it tells a super compelling story. So on the left-hand side is the air photo of the Lake Louise area. So you can see the hamlet of Lake Louise is the blob that's in there. And we've got the Trans-Canada Highway going on one side of the Bow River. We've got the CPR train tracks going on the other side. The bow is winding through here. And um, this is the area that we've been monitoring. The monitoring design I inherited from this multi-metric approach that the graduate student had chosen. So even though I don't really need an upstream control to this because she had done it, we have continued to do it this way. And I'm not showing her previous data, but we can compare it at least based on abundances. Uh, the top red arrow on the left-hand side, if you go to the tail of that arrow, that is um, the Bow River just before it um, crosses under the Trans-Canada for the first time 
And this is a pristine location. It's also where the long-term river water quality monitoring site happens. And then as you come down the river, you're heading down this diagram, heading south, you pass the hamlet and then the red star. That's where the wastewater treatment plant is. Two kilometers downstream of the wastewater treatment plant is the left tail of my second arrow. That is considered the fully mixed zone. So all of the treated water coming out of the wastewater treatment plant has been fully integrated into the ecosystem. And it's our second monitoring location. We call this downstream one. And then another 13 Ks down the river is the last arrow. And this one is called downstream two. And um, the graduate student put it here for particular reasons. I'll talk about it in a minute. So just to recap, this is a mechanical process plant with biological nutrient removal and alum. Uh, we upgraded it in 2006. And after it was upgraded, we saw really good recovery of the biological indicators in the river. But the early years we're using a different, the multi-metric method. This wastewater treatment plant has never exceeded any guidelines for wastewater treatment plant discharges in the province of Alberta or any surface water quality guidelines. Um, so this is where this issue with the surface water quality guidelines and CCME not really being able to um, account for cumulative impacts or the pristine nature of this receiving water. Um, and then I also want to add that we saw some pretty significant visitation increases post the 2013 floods, partly because Kananaskis was really damaged and a lot of places weren't available to people and the park wasn't hit so badly. And so we were really, our visitation increased 20, 30% and it stayed up there for the last few years. So um, I'm pretty sure we're exceeding the 20, 2006 upgrades and we are actually in the process of upgrading it again. So the middle is showing us the data. The upstream sites are the first little table, the downstream one is the middle, and the downstream two is bottom. And you can see the upstream sites are pretty much sitting within reference or slightly divergent during this whole time period. Things are going pretty good. And the downstream site is also pretty good. And in the past, before the upgrades, it was not so good. So whatever's going on in the river is fully integrated by then. But you can see the like the rate right downstream of the wastewater treatment plant in 2011 it was within reference and then things have just gotten worse over time so it's definitely time for us to do this upgrade next slide please here is another way that we are using cabin that we had not imagined uh, when we first started developing it um, so we are doing some larger landscape level fish restoration projects in my region of the Mountain National Parks. And one of the things that we're doing is using a chemical called rotenone. Uh, it's a fish toxicant and it definitely can impact zooplankton, phytoplankton, and the benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, and when you take the training and you go through the standard operating procedures, it does tell you that you do need to monitor your benthic invertebrates as part of your program, but it doesn't tell you exactly how to do it. And so most people in the US where this product is widely used are just using the basic metrics and, and some of the things that um, Emily had talked about. But we've decided we're going to use our predictor reference model as well. So we could still do all those metrics, but we can also use our fancy community-based model. Uh, so this image on the right is just showing you this lake that we um, introduced this chemical into in 2018. So we've got this headwater lake, hidden lake. It's got non-native brook trout in it. They have completely excluded the West Slope cutthroat trout, our threatened fish that used to be in this lake. And they have taken over this whole creek. And as you're coming down the creek, just when you get close to the deactivation site, there's a waterfall. And then below that waterfall, the brook trout are coming over that waterfall. And now they're starting to ruin the fish populations of cutthroat trout in the lower section of this creek. And eventually this creek flows right through the heart of the Lake Louis ski area. So in 2017, we collected pre-treatment benthic macroinvertebrate data for all of these locations as we come down this watershed. And then in 2018, we did our first treatment. And uh, one month or so after we did the first rotenone treatment, we came out and we measured our benthic invertebrates using cabin. And then we did our second scheduled treatment in 2019. And then again, one month later, we came back out and we measured our bugs. And now 2020, the lake has had uh, one year post-treatment to rest. And our data will be available shortly. But what we are expecting to see is the start of the recovery for this location.
So as you come down this ecosystem, the bugs at the top of the system at the lake where we put in the highest concentration of rote known um, are affected dramatically in the first year. So we saw decreases in overall abundance from thousands to hundreds. And then as you come down the system, it becomes, uh, it's breaking down all by itself. And then there are also some tributaries that come in and dilute it. And um, so you can see that in 2018 at that second location, Hidden Creek, it's only in the yellow. As we get down a little further in the system in 2018, we actually get below our deactivation area. And we have successfully stopped the route known from leaving our treatment area. And as we go into the locations outside of our study area, everything's normal. Then we came back one year later and we treated it all over again. So this is an accumulation. The first year we hit them a little bit and the second year we hit them even worse because we knocked back that 200 bugs that was left by the lake. And now we can see that the negative impact has gone a little bit more downstream um, as we're coming through, but still again at our Temple Lodge control site, no impacts whatsoever. And this year we're hoping we're gonna start to see some recovery. And our plan is actually to start reintroducing our threatened West Slope cutthroat trout into this area. Uh, starting this summer, I hope. And during this entire time, the water grabs look totally normal. Um, and the um, special monitoring that we did to actually see the rote known, the concentrations of the rote known line up really nicely with what's going on with what the bugs are telling us is happening to them. We're going to publish this, uh, I think, next year. Next slide, please. Um, this is my last case study. Um, when we started, I don't think we really had any idea that we would be seeing fire effects um, quite like we are. Um, but you can also look at fire. And I know that fire is a naturally occurring process on the landscape, um, but we're also using it as a management tool in some places. And even though it is a natural process, there is no doubt that it can cause some pretty big changes. There can be some really short-term pH changes that can um, kill fish. And then there can be some longer-term changes as well. Uh, when we did the randomized field campaign for Kootenai National Park in 2018 for the State of the Park report, we ended up with three sites that were inside of old burn polygons because about 40% of Kootenai burned since we developed our model. So we were just going to end up with some random sites anyways uh, that were inside of a burn. And these are all wildfire stand replacing super intense fire. Um, the three images that you see are three different rivers that were in the burn and they're all a little bit out of reference and they are all post fire. Um, so that was interesting and we will continue to monitor them. It's not making us stopping doing burning or anything. We're just adding it to kind of what we're keeping an eye on. And then at the same time as we're doing this, um, Banff and Waterson also have things going on where they're applying cabin to fire. Um, so Banff National Park, I'm sure people have heard, we've done this reintroduction of bison. And it's in the front ranges in Banff. And um, in addition to this, we, um, uh, they've got prescribed fire, uh, bison, and some control locations where they've got nothing. And so they're doing this multi-river experiment. And then Waterson Lakes also uh, did their big field campaign in 2018. And then they had a park that, or a fire that burned a huge part of the park. And so now they're going to be going forward through time using cabin to monitor the recovery of the park. And that's my fire example. And I think that's my second last slide. Yep. So I wanted to thank everybody for their time. My email is here. And um, hopefully I haven't gone too long and we've got a chance if people have got some operational questions.